Welcome everyone to the Mastermind Book Club. Tonight, tonight we have an important book that we're going over. It is called Lead the Field. Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale. Earl Nightingale is amazing. He is very powerful. He is very astute and has given us ways to improve our habits, to improve our lifestyle, and to make things work according to a specific plan. And that's what we are reviewing tonight, a summary slash review slash comments from the peanut gallery. So I'd like to hand over the mic to Reggie, Ruth, and Charles, and just to tell us what what did you get out of this book? And I know there's a lot of information in here, but any one or two things or three things that you can think about is great. So, uh, Ruth, would you like to go first? Not to put you on the spot. I'll take that as a no. Charles or Reggie? <laughs> would you like to go? I, I, I started oh, off. Sorry, sorry. I was, uh, I was muted. I, I was, oh. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I would say, no, I was first. like, ladies first. Ladies first, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, okay. I'll, 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 okay. So anyways, this, yeah, this book, like I said, is just amazing. Um, and I did, I never, I have never seen this book before and I've read so many of them. But the one thing that stood out to me is what he said about William James, um, about an essay that William James uh, wrote in the Vital Reserve essay. And he says, um, we're making only a small use of part of our possible mental and physical resources. The human individual thus live for far within his limits. He lives far within his limits. He possesses power of various uh, resources which he habitually fails to use and he energizes below his maximum and he behaves below his optimum. Man, that thing blew me out of the water. You know, because then, um, we have this human body, human spirit, human soul, and the mind, you know, which makes us, distinguishes us from the birds, from the animals, other animals, you know, who can't, you know, use their prefrontal cortex. And yet, because of the system, I guess, that most of us have grown up in, we have limited ourselves to just being regular people. And anyways, this thing hit me on the head today because I have so many talents. And should I have been focusing on, if I had focused on one of them early on in life and just see that fruition and, you know, on another um, talent and do the same thing, I'd be in a far better place than where I am today. So thank you for this book, uh, David and the group. I really appreciate it. And I'm enjoying you. it. So. Thank you. Can you just uh, say the name of the person from the essay again? I just want to write it William down. William James. That's what I thought. William James. I, I think, think we, yeah, William James. We, yeah. I think uh, Reggie introduced me to William James. Uh, yes, William James. As we started a while back, I think, but I could be wrong. I always like to blame Reggie for the good things. <laughs> but uh, That's awesome. But he's, you know, that's how it is. So um, thank you, Ruth. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Charles, would you like to take the Well, I'm the just going to piggyback a, a quick minute off of what Ruth said, because uh, I really like that, what she said. Uh, that, that, that inspired me, too. I'm going to talk about something totally different. It was, she was saying that pretty much we're, we're, born, we're the only species on the planet that is born without a instinct. Like, so we, we don't, we're the only species on the planet that can create our own free will. We can create, we have the ability to create where all, right. as all other animals are instinctive. You know, they, they do according to, to their pattern. We're the only ones that can create our own pattern. I, I thought that was awesome too. But what, what, I, what I really struck me was the part where he talked about sowing and reaping. Rewards come from service to others, which is humanity. To the extent we serve, uh, to the extent we serve more people, we will receive everything in life that we want. My aunt used to tell me that when I was a little boy working in her fish store. She said, "Boy, you can have whatever you want in life if you just work hard enough for it." 
But I want to rephrase that. You can have everything in life if you just serve others. So tangible and intangible. Um, men, uh, my millionaire mentors used to say early in life that, uh, and also in the book, Think and Grow Rich, once again, you can have everything you want if you, you help others achieve what they want. It's the law of reciprocity. Uh, the goal is to think of some ways to serve. Like, so the, he told the story of somebody, they were in Monterey Beach in California and they, they were sitting there talking about, well, how can we stay here? Um, you know, we, we have no money. They were, they were about to leave. And he commented that they had so much potential that if they just thought of some way to serve others, you know, washing cars, uh, cutting the grass, walking dogs, et cetera, you know, everything that we need is right there in, in between our two ears. Uh, we, we have a fertile, I guess, land. And then that led me to, to, the, uh, to the story of the farmer where the farmer had this beautiful land and the pastor came by on a Sunday and said, wow, you're really blessed to have this beautiful land. God has really blessed you. And he said, yes, I'm very thankful and very grateful, but you should have seen it before. You should have seen it when God had it. <laughs> <laughs> so but, but, and what's meant that he just put the time, effort and love into it. So that, that brought me back to some plant, some seed, or some plant, some water, uh, some see, but God gets the gets the increase. So we've been each given a plot of land that we can we can use, and that plot of land is how we service others. But one good thing he said that really hit home is that you can't just deal with your land one time. You have to constantly be persistent in developing your land, and that that, that just reached out to me. Um, and and you know. These stories are not taught in school or these methodologies are not taught in school. Uh, what else did I say? I talked about the persistence from the uh, farming, seed time, harvest time. And then he, he said, ask yourself daily, how can I increase service to others? So I, I, that, that's one thing that uh, I'm, I'm definitely gonna focus on. And uh, I really enjoyed the book. There's so many other tidbits. I'm sure as people you know, talk about certain things that have come back to memory for me. I really enjoyed the book, David. Thank you, Charles. That that is very powerful. You brought me back to something very important. But I'm, I'll share after uh, I hear what if Reggie or Ty want to say anything in reference to this book, Lead the Field. Reggie, um, I'd like Reggie to go first, if that's okay. Uh, if you're are available, Reg. One second. Time's up. <laughs> hey, one second. You know, wow. Faster than you think. Hey. Yeah, we, when we say that, we don't think about how literal that is. Right. I, mean, I was talking to, to, to Charles about the book earlier, which I don't think is really a book. Or maybe it is a book because I know he has a whole series called Leader Field, you know, a series of recordings. Thing about uh, Earl Nightingale, he had studied the greats, quote unquote greats, people like Paul Harvey. And Paul Harvey was a great orator, great, um, what do you call it? Uh, radio, he, did like, he did a radio show for a bunch of years. So this was one of the guys that um, Earl Nightingale studied. And by studying him, somebody who will, will label one of the greats, he was able to pick up this nice oratory, his way of his oratorial skills. And so from that, it's like people who have good oratorial skills, oratorical skills are people who, when they, when they talk, and they have something good to say, you listen. <clears throat> and he has a lot of good to say. And that's basically embodied in this, this recording or these recordings and other you know, books and recordings that he's put out. And I called it a, a, a composite of kind of like life, um, like, like steps or like a book that you could sort of follow, sort of like stepping through life in terms of how to, how to live. You know, how to, you know, how to think, how to comport yourself, how to, you know, behave in certain settings, you know, what you could do and not do, which is going to return you a certain, certain return in terms of, you know, if you're working and you decide, you know, you want to succeed in, the, in a job, especially if you work with someone else, even if you work for yourself, there's a certain amount of discipline you have to put into 
that work, there's a certain amount of um, effort you have to put into it. And so everything is ultimately going to come on, come down to you. And so if like you want to succeed, if you want to do things, you got to understand what, you know, input you have to put into that thing. And so <clears throat> this book is a compilation of just those things, those steps that you can follow that's going to help you to have a, a successful life if you actually put them into practice on a daily or certainly with some sort of consistency. So that's what I like about it. And just a lot of sort of statements he made around, you know, you being a sort of, you know, I guess he called it your mind was like this pure vein of pure um, vein of like gold. You know, so that's what you have in you, like this pure vein of gold that if you were actually access it, you know, the things that you can get out of it. And then they sort of put the human potential in some sort of a dollar value figure, which, you know, is sort of fleeting or something that changes, but there was a point where they said, you know, we were the equivalent of so many billions of dollars just in terms of the uh, human potential. Our worth, and, yes. Yeah, but that's, that's sort of fake because, you know, like it's a man-made thing, but just to understand what the ultimate understanding is that you have this endless amount of infinite, poten infinite, infinite amount of potential in you that if you uh, access it, you can do a lot of good, a lot of good things with yourself and then your life. So I think it's just sort of to understand that the... Uh, abilities that you have. And if you access it, access those abilities the right way, and certainly if you have some sort of um, book or guide to go through or go with or, or use to utilize to basically to step yourself through it, you know, understanding yourself, your worth, and doing these different things on a daily that can really produce a certain outcome that's going to really propel you forward. You know, he certainly provides that in his in his book as a guide for you to be able to to use it to, to make those odd games in your life. Got it. That's how I would sum it up. Great. Thank you, Reg. Uh, very important insight and, and very important to be able to communicate. Uh, he is a role model. I mean, he had my attention from beginning to end in that book. So what Reggie is saying is, you know, profound. It is uh, someone that we can qualify as a role model in reference to his knowledge and his his mind and how he leads the field in communication, in service, and uh, you know, and so on. So before I I, I keep going, uh, Ty, would you like to comment? Are you able to talk? Are you busy? And uh, if you could just wave your hand because I can't hear what you're saying. No, you're muted, Ty. Can you hear me? Hi. Now, now we can hear you. Hey. I'm in the street walking. I just parked my car. All but right. I can hear you guys. All right. Can you hear All me? Right. Would you like to say anything in reference to this book, Ty? Um, I can't hear you guys. I got... Okay. All right. Good, good. She'll hear. She'll listen. So I wanted to tell you, number one is each and every one of you is doing an important role in what Earl Nightingale said. And it is service. Being in this group is, is a service. It's a service to you. And it's a service to each and every one of us. So it's reciprocal. However, have you noticed the growth that you've had since you've started in this program? Have you noticed? Yes. Right? I have. And Charles said something very important. Ten years ago, as my kids were ready, wanted to play baseball, I had to make a decision to stop working 80 to 100 hours a week in order to give them space to play sports. All my kids wanted to play, play sports at the same time. Crazy, ten years ago. And as I gave up my time, and started to do the service to my own family, which is something that Earl says, it's not about working you know, hard, it's about balance in that you should be having some fun at the same time that you're productive. We, I, totally, missed, we totally missed part of what you said, you went blank. Oh, so hold on a second, let me see if I can- Charles was actually talking and then you, all of a sudden you phased out and you came back with a whole essay. Let me try and um, give myself more Wi-Fi from my cell phone. If you give me a moment here. 
to the this laptop so I don't lose you again. Hold on. Let's see. Where are we? Here. That happens, right? Yeah, I don't. Uh, sometimes when I connect, I it gets spotty. But um, so what I was saying was when Charles hit it on the nose when when he said uh, about service that I ten years ago needed to stop working 80 to 100 hours a week in order to give service to my children. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me or no? Or am I still muted again? I can Hello? hear you now. You can hear me now. So let's we hear you. So I was cutting in and out. So I should have given myself some. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I have a connection now. Looking for my hotspot and I don't find it. So if let's try this once more. So 10 years ago, I, I had to make a decision because I was working 80 to 100 hours a week, 80 to 100 hours a week. And Earl said that we have to find balance in our lives. It's not just all about work. We have to be able to take time to enjoy life as well. So I stopped working in order to take my kids to, to baseball practice. And I didn't have one game, I had three different teams. I had to run back and forth, Saturdays and Sundays, and then practices at least twice a week. And as I did this and I started working less, I was producing more money. Can you believe that? That's the way this works. It's not about working hard, it's about having balance in your life as well. So providing service to your own family is highly important. So that's the first thing that I did. Number two is these are very important questions that Earl Nightingale asked, and I've known for quite some time. How much are you worth now? Very important question. When was the last time you asked yourself that? How much are you worth now? I ask myself that regularly, right? Now, and question number two, how much are you worth hourly? Meaning... Are you worth $10 an hour hourly, meaning 24 hours a day, you're getting 10 bucks an hour? Or are you actually worth $3 an hour and you're getting that every 24 hours? All right. These are very important questions. And then the next question that he says, and it's in this video that I posted in our private group on WhatsApp, uh, how much are you planning to be worth by the age of 65? How much are you planning to be worth by the age of 65? I don't know if you're there. I don't know if it's a few months away or a few years, but just as, just as an example, whatever age you want it to be, you should have empowering questions like this. Now, another thing that he says is when we are children, we look forward to getting presents on Christmas. But what happens two or three hours later? We get bored of the Christmas present two to three hours later, right? Have you had that happen? It's happened to me. So I know that it's happened to you. I know Ty is laughing out there how, you know, and we were kids. Whoops, internet is unstable again. Let me see if I can get an, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Down. Yes, I can okay. hear you. So, in reference to our own path to success, it relates to getting a present. It's not about achieving the end goal. It's about the process, the in-between process. Once we get whatever we consider success, we have to set a new goal, a new uh, achievement in life. Because once we stop, making these goals, then that's it. I mean, what, what else is there to live for? So just be aware that even if you reach your goal, whatever it is that you want, you've got to be ready to have to set up a new goal. You know, maybe it's you know, having a child or having a grandchild or having a great grandchild. Who knows? I, I'm just giving that one because it's pretty easy out there. But maybe it's visiting 10 
different countries in the next five years, and then you want to visit another 10 more in the next 15 years. So always have a goal that you consider success, but then be ready to add to that. Because once you achieve the goal, it's like, that's it. This is according to Earl Nightingale, and I believe that he's not far from the truth. Now, what are the four functions of a business? Finance, production, sales, and research. He mentions this at least twice in the book. Uh, finance, production, sales, and research. Very important. This is the basic parts of a business plan finance production sales and research if you don't have your finances right if you're not producing the work that's needed and generating the sales and doing research where your clients come from how are you going to get it right i'm there myself so i've hired someone who uh unfortunately has gone missing in action and i hope uh, they come back soon and that's what happens when you're with your business if you get careless and I've gotten a little bit careless. Actually, I was ill for quite a few for a few weeks. So that happened. The amount of money that we receive will always be in direct ratio to the demand of what we do, our ability to do it and the difficulty of replacing you. So meaning if you want to be a security guard. It's pretty easy. All you all you have to do is pay probably 150 bucks, sit down and watch a boring movie or two, and voila, you're a licensed security guard. How come do I know this? Because I used to be licensed. Did I ever need the license? No. But it's very easy to be a security guard, a porter, uh, someone who works at a supermarket, uh, a driver, an Uber driver, or one of those company drivers. Uh, now, if you want to be someone like Earl Nightingale or something similar, that takes a lot. And are you implementing what you need to get you there? In other words, highly skilled versus easy to replace. A highly skilled person can be paid whatever amount of money in a few minutes time if they or if you know how to solve specific problems that people need solved. So what was one of these problems that Earl Nightingale said? He talked to a high-end owner of a company, right? And he told this high-end owner of this company is, I can resolve one of your major problems in your company. And he said, how? So what was the problem? Earl Nightingale told him, write down the top six things that you need accomplished. And that's the, so he, so the owner wrote the top six. And then he told him, write down the order in which, in the order of importance of these, which is number one and which is number six and so on, right? Once he wrote these down, he told him, focus on number one until you accomplish it, and then you move to number two. This is a problem that we all face, multitasking. That's the name. Everybody says multitasking is great, right? Is it? I don't know. I mean, we've read a few books talking about this, splitting up our time on different subject matters. Well, getting back to what I just said, highly skilled versus easy to replace, both are very important. We need someone to take care of our buildings, to be a security guard, to be a driver, to uh, clean the building and so on, or, or um, maids. They're both very important. But do you really want to always remain an easy to replace person or attempt to become a highly skilled person? You see, Ruth told us something very important at the beginning, and I don't know who else captured it. She's doing a educational program, right, Ruth? An educational program is what you're doing? It's done. It is done. But it, it, was it easy to do? No. 
right? No. You, gotta, you didn't no, you didn't do it in two hours, did you? Lots of challenges. It's it's a lot. So, in order to have no. this this type of, uh, you know, highly skilled uh, background, you need to sweat. You need to go through some tough waters. So what Ruth did, I'm in the process of doing right now. I don't know about having a website. I don't know exactly where it's going, but I'm attempting to create the program before I need it. Now, as I just mentioned to you, the six things that you need to focus on, what, how did he tell us to focus on these things? Get a sheet of paper, right at the top of the sheet of paper, the number one thing you want to focus on and then get another sheet of paper and write the number two thing down and so on. So what did, what have I started doing? I started focusing on my one major thing on a daily basis and try and meditate or just a moment of silence and think about ways that I can improve on, on what I want to do during the day or, or throughout, um, you know, the week and so on. It depends on you. You focus. I hear you, David. Well, sorry, 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 sorry with this connection. Uh, let me just see if I can get it squared away again here. Let's see. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, David. Test. All yeah, right. Yeah, All right. So, please, if you have 10 things to do, Write them down, put them in order of importance. Which one are you going to focus on first? It's so important that it will make the difference and impact on your life. So Lead the Field is a very powerful book. I highly recommend it. I will be listening to this in another week or two or so after I, I listen to another book. But this book has a lot of what we all need to get ahead in life. So does anyone else want to add into this review of Lead the Field? Going once, going twice. I think we, uh, I think we all kind of added some good stuff. I think that- This guy was a very, very, very smart dude. I mean, you know, we, we pretty much hit it on the head. We kind of went through, a, just kind of breaking down some of what he talked about and just sort of how he, how he talked about it. And he was known as the Dean of Education. That was his nickname. So, you know, if you think about that, that title, that nickname itself and what, what he imparted, it definitely, definitely seems to go hand in hand with, you know, what, what it is that he, um, you know, his guidance. So. Got it. Got it. I'll just it. say that. <clears throat> All right. Well, this is it for the review. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. This book is very important to peruse through again as often as you want. I've listened to part of this book for a few years now, but I didn't comprehend it until I got to listening to the whole book. And that is why it's important to have a few books in your life that you're willing to concentrate on and study, all right? It's not about getting thousands and thousands of books under your belt. It's about studying and becoming a proficient practitioner in a few books, all right? Everyone, have a great evening. And until next time, this is David Diaz, uh, Mastermind Book Club, signing off. Have a